WCOC represented here. Dale, thanks for being here. Again, we hope we have all of your questions in hand. But let me tell you, we've got a lot more questions that we're going to have time to get to uh, in, the, uh, in the hour that we have designated. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for coming out tonight to the 12th District Congressional Forum here at Ogeechee Technical College Auditorium. And thanks to all of you watching live uh, on StatesboroHerald.com and other streaming services. The Statesboro Herald is sponsoring tonight's forum, and I'm Joe McLamory, president of the Statesboro Herald. And I'll be your moderator this evening as we learn more about the two candidates and their positions on the issues. You will hear from the candidates in a moment, but first let me introduce the candidates. Incumbent Republican Congressman Rick Allen and Democratic challenger Reverend Francis Johnson. Ladies and gentlemen. We welcome all of you to tonight's forum. Uh, first, the candidates will be given two minutes each uh, to introduce themselves. Then they will be asked a series of questions, many of which came from you in the audience, relating to their candidacy and issues that you are concerned about. We'll alternate the order of those questions as to who answered the last question. Uh, candidates will be given up to two minutes to respond to each question. And finally, at the end, candidates will be given two minutes to make a closing statement. Renetta Ward of the Statesboro Herald is uh, seated on the first row. Renetta, raise your hand. Um, and she is our official timekeeper. Uh, during your statements and answers, she will hold up a sign when you have 30 seconds remaining and then 15 seconds remaining, and finally zero. Uh, questions will come from a combination of the States for Herald and the audience, the questions that were submitted earlier tonight, as we indicated earlier. I'm sorry we won't be able to get to all of your questions, but we're grateful for those questions, and we will try to select the questions that appear to be the most germane to this audience. No gotcha questions. We say this every time we host one of these, but no questions, please. Like, have you stopped feeding your wife? We don't, <laughs> we don't want to hear that. And those questions will not be asked by the moderator, so I hope you haven't included them in the questions submitted. So, that's enough for me. Let's start with our opening statements. Congressman Allen, you have two minutes. Thank you, Joe, and thank you all for coming out tonight. It's a privilege to be with you. First, I'd like to introduce my wife, Robin. Honey, would you stand? Uh, Robin is, uh, has much influence in Washington. She is the president of the Republican Congressional Spouses Club, which I say is the most influential caucus in the United States Congress. And uh, I can tell you a story after, the, uh, after we uh, finish here tonight to, to illustrate that. But it's great to be with you. It's, uh, you know, I ran for Congress for, one, for several reasons, but the biggest reason was to grow the economy and grow jobs. Uh, you know, the greatest privilege I've had in my life is to give folks the dignity and respect that comes with a good job. To allow them, to uh, empower them to do what God created them to do. And to allow them to provide for their family, uh, their church, their communities, and yes, this nation. And, you know, I was in Congress the first two years, and I just wasn't sure that was going to happen. Uh, but these last two years have been a lot different. Three years ago, my conference got together, and 
we knew that 70% of the people in this country did not like the direction of the country. And so we put together a strategy how to deal with health care and the problems of rising health care premiums and quality of care, tax reform, growing jobs, rebuilding our military, welfare to work, and balance of power. And I want to tell you that this has been one of the most productive Congresses in history. We have passed over a thousand bills. Uh, we've passed over 200 in, in the law. Uh, the president had 70% of the legislation the president it's almost 70% is bipartisan. And so uh, we have uh, heard the people, and this conference and this president have delivered. Right now, we have 7 million jobs open in this country, and I'm glad to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Allen. Now, Reverend Johnson. Thank you, Joe, and to the Statesboro Herald for hosting this important forum. And thank you, President Durden, and to the Ahiji Technical College and staff and the students for having us here tonight. Uh, I'm Francis Johnson. I'm a pastor, and I have uh, worked with God's people here in Bullock County and Bryan County for the last 20 years as a senior leader of the Mount Moriah Missionary Baptist Church and the Magnolia Missionary Baptist Church. I'm also a lawyer, and I've represented some of you in here in civil and criminal matters before the state and federal courts uh, here in Georgia. And I'm privileged to be the Democratic nominee for the United States Congress, the 116th Congress. I'm running for the exact reason that my brother, Rick Allen, ran four years ago, because the, he believed that the congressman who was sitting was not doing the job. And here's what I will say to you. Over and over again, you'll hear him talk about the economy, but it's not the economy of rural Georgia, and it's certainly not the economy of Bullock County. He will talk about jobs being created, but he will fail to mention that those jobs are in urban centers like Atlanta. But what about the folks here in Statesboro, 30458, 30460, 30461? We deserve the same kind of quality of life as people who live in Augusta, or Evans, or Atlanta, or Washington, D.C. While I appreciate that Robin has made her way well in Washington and has gotten along with folks there, we need a fighter in Washington. Someone who's going to do something And 50% in Statesboro. That's not acceptable. It wasn't acceptable when he took up the mountain to run, and it's not acceptable now. We're 47th in workforce readiness, 50th in infant mortality. We can do better. 12 out of 19 counties, the entire school population gets free and reduced lunch. And it's not because things are going so well, Brother Allen. It's because people are hurting. There are two Americas. There's one America that you are talking about tonight, that you put on your signs and put on your commercials, and another America that I get to live in every day and pastor and, uh, and help those folks to get on their way. And so I would urge folks to get out and vote in this election and vote. If you, if you like what you got, keep what you got. If you think we can do better, my name is Francis Johnson, and I'm running for Congress. Uh, obviously, we're deepening that board. The 
president has uh, issued another $45 million to continue that project, and uh, it will be completed in just a few years. As far as the impact of that port, uh, it, it's an export port, meaning that whether it's uh, wood chips or uh, wood pellets or uh, cotton or whatever, uh, we're sending it out of that port. And uh, like I said, it's the fourth busiest port in the world, or in the United States. The importance of that port cannot be underestimated for the 12th district, and this is the reason why. Obviously, yes, I would support a direct uh, path from uh, Savannah through Augusta uh, to, uh, I guess, I-85 is what you're, what you're talking about there, Joe. And uh, I think that would, uh, you know, obviously be good for getting goods up that way. Because right now, if you're on Highway 16, uh, it's container after container going up to the uh, uh, to where, the, where they load it on the railroad. I think it'd be a good idea for us to have another railroad exchange in the district. And I'm working toward that as far as getting closer into the port and near the railroad so that we can load those containers and they can be shipped to, uh, out across the, the country. But yes, you, uh, the economic impact of the port is enormous. The Georgia delegation is in full support of it, and we're doing everything we can to get it done. Thank you. Reverend Johnson. Yes, it uh, bears uh, mentioning that uh, I'm glad to get that update, and it would have been good for the citizens of Statesboro to have regular town halls with the congressmen so they could have gotten updates about all of those things. But make no mistake about it. If you elect me to Congress, not only will I go and do the job, but I'll come back and give you reports on a timely basis. This is the first time that uh, I'm aware that Mr. Allen has been back in this district for a public forum to hear any of those updates. You know, Max Burns proposed that in the state when he was in Congress. That was more than a decade ago. You see, folks come and the time they've been in office. And I think if someone is asking to be reelected, you ought to say, what have you done? Not what you're trying to get done, but what have you done? The fact of the matter is we still have a port that is largely fragmented and separated from the largest cargo operation in the world at Hartsville Atlanta. And the great many of us who live between the ports and Hartsville Atlanta don't get the benefit from the bounty that is the fourth largest port in the world. And that's wrong. And it's wrong because we have a congressman who's not doing his job. We've got a fragmented rail line system that needs to be pulled together. We need new investment to have a dedicated rail line between the ports and Atlanta so we can move freight uh, uh, to and fro there. And we need to stop just repaving 70 year old ideas like I-16. We need to have dedicated trucking lines on I-16 so that you don't have to put your family in the Russian roulette between those, uh, those big transfer trucks. That's not promises. You need to send somebody to go to Congress and get that done not come here after four years of being in Washington, uh, whining and dining and talk about what they plan on doing. <laughs> in, in Bullock County, we are folks who believe in just do it. Okay, our next question, and this is a question we will begin with Reverend Johnson as we alternate. And this also relates to transportation. In response to tariffs imposed by President Trump, China has placed tariffs on soybeans, pork, and other agricultural products that have caused prices to drop. And these products, and, and, and this has placed these products and some farmers in jeopardy. Do you support tariffs as part of our trade policy? And what can be done to assist farmers in District 12 that are negatively affected by the policy? Thank you for the question. I want to make sure you understand something. Tariff is just a fancy word that politicians use when they want to pass a tax. And in the same way, when they say things like we're going to privatize roads to get them redeveloped and put a toll on it, that's just another fancy word that politicians like my brother Rick Allen like to say, but it's just a tax. These taxes are hurting our farmers. They're hurting our onion farmers in Vidalia. They're hurting our specialty farmers who are doing blueberries and pecans, they're hurting our manufacturing industry, and they're unnecessary. The president launched this unnecessary tariff war against China, and instead of farmers being able to 
harvest their crops and sell them on markets that we took 20 years to develop in some of these places. Brazil and Canada are stepping up to fill the ranks. You know, Georgia is the largest producer of soybeans uh, to China in the world. Brazil is right there. And because of those tariffs, Brazil will fill those places. Peanuts, the same way. And so if you want a congressman who's going to be silent about the suffering of farmers, stick with what you got. You got somebody, if you want someone who's going to go up and tell it like it is, tell the truth that tariffs are nothing more than taxes and burdens on the American people. And we've got to stop this unnecessary trade war and get back to the business of business, then you need to elect Francis Johnson as your next congressman. Yes. 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 Okay. yes, I'm assuming that Mr. Johnson doesn't know had a massive trade deficit in this country for generations. What that means is that is wealth flowing right out of this country. In the billions, folks, in the billions, you wonder why the economy wasn't growing four years ago? You wonder why this guy got elected president? Because he was willing to tackle the problem. He said, promises made, promises kept, folks. No, no, no. And let me tell you something. We just renegotiated now, okay? And, uh, you know, we're, we, we've got the details on that, and our farmers are very pleased with that. NAFTA completely wiped out the vegetable uh, and fruits uh, production and sales in Florida. And we have, the president has negotiated a new treaty that is much better than what we had. It's going to bring jobs back to this country. Now, you know, one thing, let's talk about how it's hurt agriculture. We were supposed to pass the agriculture bill September 30th, okay? Not one member of the Democratic Party in the House of Representatives voted for the agriculture bill. Because it wasn't an agriculture bill. It was a big grab from corporate agricultural interests. Reverend Johnson, please. Well, allow the Congress. I will let it finish. Yes. Uh, well, uh, it was a very good agriculture bill. Uh, our farmers and the industri industry groups were very, very pleased with it. And uh, like I said, I'm on the conferee committee right now to uh, conference with the Senate and pass an agriculture bill. Now, you know, that was a kick in the face to our farmers. And I'm assuming he would have voted against the farm bill. Is that who you want to be your congressman? Yes. You gotta be yes. kidding. Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, well, let me tell you this. Uh, we gotta get the farm bill done. We got a lot we gotta get done. You know, uh, again, uh, you know, I'm in the district all the time. I am meeting with groups all the time. Um, I am meeting with groups every day. And let me tell you something. I've never seen a turnaround in a district like this. I've never seen it in my life. And I am very pleased to be a part of it. And I played a big part of it. And I'm proud of that. And thank you. And I want to continue this great work in the United States Congress because this district is adding jobs. We, we will be in this district the Silicon Valley of the East Coast. And I have been working on that. That's funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you're better than this. Please stop uh -oh. interrupting the responses. Well, you need to you need to visit the Cypress Center of Excellence, and we uh, put a hundred million. This governor put a hundred million dollars worth of buildings on this Battle River. I mean, and people are going to be coming from all over the country. I can see you take credit for the governor's work. That's not your work. Uh, if the military had not been funded. The governor would not be building that. Was on the, that was on the building blocks. And anybody who's building the military in this place knows that if your military is building something today, it was planned 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. There's no way you can take credit for that. That credit belongs to John Barrow for getting that cybersecurity command on the day to be built. Don't take credit for that. We're, we're, we're going to move on to the next question. question now. <laughs> <laughs> This question goes to Congressman Allen. Some polls have indicated that health care continues to be. Brother Moderator, I don't want to interrupt you, but he, he suggested that I would vote against something, and 
Do I get a chance to respond to that? You'll have a closing opportunity here in a few minutes, and you guys can respond to any questions that's been asked or questions that haven't been asked. That's up to you. You'll have two minutes sure, at thanks. the end of the program. So, some national polls indicate that health care is considered uh, to be a very important concern for voters across America. Health care costs continue to rise over the, uh, over the board, either working within the framework of Obamacare or creating a new system. What is a realistic approach to rein in the cost of health care, including prescription medications, that would create a system of affordable health insurance rates? Yes, uh, I was chairman of the St. Joseph Hospital Board for nine years, and uh, during this time we began to uh, experience some of the government interference with, uh, with health care. Uh, before Obamacare, we were spending about $80 billion on Medicaid and Medicare. Today we're spending $300 billion, and in 10 years it's expected to be over $1 trillion dollars. But get this, you got a $300 billion business, a few business people out there. You got a $300 billion business. We have a $1.2 trillion agency in Washington running that business. If you ran your business that way, you would, I mean, your overhead is 2,000%. That is why we need to block grant money to our states to run our health care system. The biggest difference that that would make is the only way folks to save money in health care, and you can talk to any professional out there, any doctor, and guess what, you probably ought to talk to doctors because they've been kind of left out of the equation, and you ought to talk to all the providers, but you have to restore the doctor-patient relationship. Okay. Health care is a partnership, for crying out loud. If you don't do what your doctor says to it, if you don't take your meds, it gets really expensive. And we have to have restore that partnership, because you've got this $1.2 trillion agency in Washington that has removed, the, that is making decisions on how long you stay in the hospital, how long you get rehabilitation. You know, uh, and as far as the drug situation, uh, you know, PBMs, another, uh, another mess caused by Washington, you know, you walk in there and you go to get uh, your prescription filled and the pharmacist can't even tell you, you know, you, well, you got a $1,300 copay, but you pay $40 cash for this medicine. <coughs> That's just wrong, folks. And, you know, our health care legislation addressed that. It addressed folks with pre-existing conditions with a high-risk, uh, invisible high-risk pool. And, uh, again, we got no Democratic help to try to solve this health care problem. So here we are, stuck with this Obamacare. Reverend Johnson. Thank you. So many words. So many words. And remember, all these words are to try to distract you from one truth. The truth will make you free. For six years, the Republican caucus said they had a better plan than the Affordable Care Act. And for two years of the presidential election cycle, they argued that if you elect a Republican president, he would show us a better plan. Right. It would be a plan that you could keep your doctor, that it would not discriminate against pre-existing conditions, that children could stay on the, they have parents' health insurance they reach 26, it would lower the cost of drugs and prescriptions. They promised the world. And right now they've been in power in Washington, D.C. with the Congress, the Senate and the House, and the presidency, and we're yet to see that better plan. That's the truth. The truth of the matter is, he says, give the states block grants to expand their own programs. I don't think Mr. Allen, he knows a lot about building, and certainly taking government contracts to build, but I don't think he knows the difference between Medicaid and Medicare. Medicaid, if you expand Medicaid, it would save Claxton's Hospital, it would save Meadows Hospital, and make sure that they don't overrun our hospital here in Statesboro. But because of their philosophical differences with the president, President Barack Obama, they refused to expand our system of Medicaid right here in Georgia. 
Let me tell you what that means. It means that eight million dollars every day, 12 billion dollars over the course of this argument that they've been having has gone to other states. Jerry Brown in California expanded Medicaid and so did Jan Brewer of Arizona. And anytime Jan Brewer and Jerry Brown can agree on something, then Georgia are getting on. But instead, those $12 billion are going to support citizens in Ohio and New Jersey and even Kentucky, wow. the home state of Mitch McConnell, who stood in the way of the Affordable Care Act. If you don't have a better idea, you are resigned your seat. Matter of fact, with your help, you can help me take that seat, and the 116th Congress will do something to fix our health care crisis. The next question begins with Reverend Johnson. Uh, the federal budget deficit is projected at $985 billion for fiscal year 2019. Uh, Reverend Johnson, you've supported a number of programs that potentially could balloon the deficit. How would you propose to reduce the budget deficit and support your priorities? Absolutely. My priorities are simple. Here they are. I'm going to go to Washington, D.C. and work on infrastructure. 30% of this district doesn't have high-speed connectivity, and that's a shame. Our bridges and roads are deficient. There are 40 bridges in this 12th congressional district that are structurally deficient or have a poor rating according to the United States Department of Transportation. Your families, not red families or blue families, but all of our families ride right across those bridges. That's my number one priority. Education, we gotta rethink it and reimagine what it looks like in the 21st century. We gotta fix our healthcare crisis, we gotta make sure we continue to produce a climate where jobs can thrive and be located in this area. But make no mistake about it, we can do everything, but we can't do it if we give more to people who've already taken so much. You thought if you elected a bill with the Congress and sent one to the White House, you might got an infrastructure bill. Not a single infrastructure bill today. But you have got a $1.5 trillion tax credit, tax fraud, which they call a tax plan, that gave more to people who already got bailed out in 28, 2008. And so, no, we can't. We've got to prioritize. That's the difference between having day traders in charge of our government who are there to get what they can get right now and those who believe and invest in America. When we invest in rural America, we do so for the long term. And so what I say is that all of these things can be done, but you can't do it if you keep giving power to the same folks who are taking it. And what do we have to show for it? What do we have to show for it? Not a single bill this congressman has passed in the four years he's been in Congress. That's like going to law school and never taking a case to trial. That's like being a medical doctor and never wanting to see patients. If you don't want to write legislation to improve rural America, you ought to let somebody who can get the job done go and get it done. Thank you. Amen. It's not going to balloon the deficit. The deficit is the largest deficit we've ever had right now. And we got nothing to show for it. She asked the question, she said, how is it going to balloon the deficit? It won't. These folks run for Congress on trimming the deficit but they always get in office and spend all the money. Yeah. Dr. Johnson, I'm going to insist that the questions come from the moderator and not from the audience. I appreciate your enthusiasm. I, as a <laughs> citizen of America, I am thrilled to see your enthusiasm. Thank you. But let me ask the questions, please. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, uh, obviously, uh, the last time that we had a balanced budget was in 2001, and if you look at the conditions then, uh, we had a very good economy. Uh, we had about 17 million people on government assistance. Uh, we had uh, you know, very low employment, maybe not as low as it is today. Uh, right now, uh, we've got 42 million people stuck in poverty. That's all. 20 million of those people are work capable. Yet, the Democrats voted not to give those people an opportunity to go to work. And that's what I went to Congress for, is to give folks the opportunity and the dignity and the respect that they deserve to have a good job. Now folks, here's how they're gonna balance the budget. It's called GDP, it's called economic power. If 
you don't have economic power, you cannot balance the budget. We've added six trillion dollars to the balance sheet. Every percentage point of GDP growth, you add almost two trillion dollars to the balance sheet. Now this, the only way we're gonna grow and, 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 and get out of this deficit is to get our good people the good jobs. And we've got, we've got seven million jobs open in this country. We are ready, we get those folks back to work, and we will balance this budget. This is a follow-up question to the general uh, question about the, the deficit. Uh, we start again with Congressman Allen. Uh, you supported a balanced budget amendment. Yes. Uh, since you started running for Congress, do you still support such an amendment? And under the current fiscal conditions, how would you propose we get there? Yes, because if we don't have a balanced budget amendment, uh, we're going to continue to have these backroom deals. Uh, you know, we have an appropriations process. In fact, I demanded that we follow regular order uh, just this last year, because that's the, as the President said, I am not going to vote on another one of those omnibus bills. And I didn't vote on the last one, because he grew government by 20%. Because you see, when we need to add necessary funding to our military, the Democrats said, okay, if you're going to add money to the military, we got to have money for our programs. Folks, that does not work and will not balance the budget. So what we have to do is we have to go through the regular appropriations process, and that is what the uh, in budgeting process and also the Senate has to go. That's the number one uh, reason uh, that the Congress exists, is to fund the government. But no, the Democrats don't want to participate in this. They want to do a backroom deal with leadership to get what they want. And folks, we've been doing that. Uh, this was the first year in 10 years that we actually funded our military. Can you believe that? And I will continue to insist that, that we go through regular order that we go through the appropriations process because guess what? You get to see where every dollar, you, you sit there and watch it on television and see where every dollar is spent. You wonder why these folks up there don't want you to know that? Why they want to do it in the back room? Once we do that, in fact, this year, my fellow Georgian, Tom Graves, came up with a concept called the Grandchildren's Fund. It's about two and a half percent of his appropriations package. We didn't get one Democratic vote on. Now, what about our grandchildren? I thought that was very creative, and uh, and I appreciate Tom uh, doing that. And I would hope that our other appropriators uh, would do the same. Reverend Johnson, do we need a balanced budget amendment? We certainly need a balanced budget amendment. And the only time that we uh, had a surplus in this country in the modern era was during the Democratic presidency. I want to remind my good brother of that. He seems to be estranged from the truth. The truth of the matter is, here it's coming. Watch this. The $1.5 trillion that we gave away to billionaires and millionaires, and I don't begrudge anybody's success. I just think everybody ought to pay their fair share. That's what my grandfather taught me on that farm in Sylvania, that you can't expect to take and not give. To whom much is given, much is required. And they're going to require it of your grandchildren. Here it's coming. Mitch McConnell's already signaled it. And it's in the 2019 proposed budget that was released by the White House, and it's already been signed off by the Republican caucus. They're going to propose $579 billion cut to Medicaid and a $1.5 trillion cut to Medicare. It's going to re reduce that to a little more than a coupon program. That's how they're going to get to their balanced budget. They've spent all the money on everything they can think of, including uh, ideas of launching a new branch of the armed services in outer space. <laughs> and they're going to ask you to pay for it by cutting Medicaid and Medicare, which they never believed in in the first place, and they're going to get around to doing away with Social Security as well. Why would you think people who never supported these programs would do anything but kill them? That's what they're doing, and they're, they're going to do it under the guise of deficit reduction. Isn't it amazing? After you've gone on a spending spree, 
like nobody's business. You want to tell our grandchildren they have a foot bill. We can do better than this. My opponent in this race, Rick Allen, believes this seat has been bought by the corporate interest that sent him there. He can't balance the federal budget because he can't ba balance his campaign budget. You go look on the website, FEC will tell you he's got $1.1 million outstanding loan to his own campaign for a job that pays $174,000 a year. You tell me who he's going back to Washington to work for. Next question, we will begin with Reverend Johnson. Would, what would you do to protect hardworking immigrants, many of whom drive the agricultural economy of the 12th Congressional District of Georgia? Sure. I appreciate the question. It begins with re-examining the ethos of this country. And I think that's important to do. You know, there's, there's a one, my opponent, he seemed to think if it makes money, then it's right. But there's a different set of values that run through Swainsboro and Sylvania and Statesboro, Dublin and Douglas, Ambrose and Augusta. And the money doesn't always mean that something is right. And it's wrong to treat this new wave of new Americans any differently than we've treated those who come to the shores from the very beginning. Those who came in the first wave, who were running from religious persecution in England. And those who came in other ways, leaving famine behind in Ireland, fleeing from fascism in Italy. These are people who we said, if you don't believe it, take down the Statue of Liberty and pull off the welcome mat. It said, give me your hungry, your tired, those who are yearning to be free. Either that statue, that lady liberty, means something or it doesn't. I think we ought to start with the ethos, which means that we are an immigrant country. And we might have all come here on different ships, but we're in the same boat now. And I think we've got to pass comprehensive immigration reform. That means giving a pathway to citizenship to those who are languishing in the shadows right now. They're paying taxes. And he's going to tell you in just a moment how they're committing so many crimes. I know good, hardworking folks who just want a chance that all of us have. And that's a chance to give their children a better life than they have. And in South Georgia, that's a value we still appreciate. Because I grew up not very rich. Matter of fact, we were downright poor. I didn't know how poor we were. And I'm grateful that I got ahead because I have lived in a country that provided me access to opportunity. The only opportunity they want to provide is more opportunity for them to reach into the American bank and pull more out for themselves. And so you can't get the comprehensive civil, comprehensive immigration reform when the president is willing to put children in cages as a way to generate votes in an election. And I'm sorry that I'm not smiling, but this is tough because these are real people. These are real families that are being pulled apart. And they are just as much a part of the fabric of South Georgia as any of the rest of us. Migration. My people were brought to this country in chains, 
and you will not sit here on this stage and insult people in that way. I resist that. That's a racist statement. Um, it, it is basically those who are in a, uh, folks who come here and get uh, citizenship and then bring their... Uh, like the First Lady's family. Uh, you know, they bring their, you know, they bring their parents, they bring their brothers and their sisters to the country. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, again, uh, that was uh, part of the legislation that I supported. It also helped our farmers get the labor they need, and um, I was, uh, I was really disappointed uh, that we didn't get that done. We have got to continue to work on that because our immigration laws are broken. But I can tell you this. Uh, the Democratic Party wants open borders. Uh, they won't allow anybody and everybody to come in here. And I'm going to tell you this. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, a uh, number of reasons. Uh, again, how many people do you want to let in? <laughs> I mean, think about what that would do to our economy, what that would do to, uh, you know, what we're trying to preserve here. Um, again, you know, there's probably, I don't know, uh, 150 million people that want to come to this country. Uh, I'm sure that uh, in a merit-based work program, I hear that folks would love to come here and work, but they want to go back home after that. But we got to solve this problem. In immigration is, uh, uh, again, should be a bipartisan issue, but uh, again, uh, the Democrats don't want to work with us. Uh, so that's why you need to send us back to Washington so we can get this, and I'm hoping that we get the Senate so that we can actually fix this immigration problem. Let's uh, direct our next question at Congressman Allen. Virtually all economists, or at least those I've read, agree that the way to save Social Security in its current state is to both trim benefits and raise revenue. Now given the reality that Republicans by and large see tax increases as a bad thing, and Democrats by and large see benefit cuts as a bad thing, what are you willing to do to bridge the divide and come up with a solution that will allow the Social Security program to continue into the years and the decades ahead. Uh, Social Security is pretty simple. Uh, it's those paying in versus those taking out. Again, the problem is we've got jobs available out there. We've got nobody to fill them. If we fill the jobs in this country right now and continue to grow this economy, it would, uh, and it's already doing it. It's already carrying Social Security out for years. It's carrying Medicare out for years. And yes, uh, those people who are near Social Security and, and near and, and on Social Security, and those people who are near Medi uh, Medicare and on Medicare, uh, deserve to keep that. I mean, you paid in. You made a promise. And this president has said, and I have said, we're going to keep that promise. Uh, but yes. Uh, we do need to agree, Democrats and Republicans, on a way forward. Uh, we need to uh, make sure that those folks who are in their, say, 40s, will also benefit from this program. And again, that needs to be agreed among, I mean, it's easy math. It's those who pay in versus those who take out. And it must be sustained. Uh, you know, Social Security was not designed to live on. In return, uh, it was not. It was designed as a supplement, and I'm hoping uh, that folks. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I know in my company, uh, when we were young and uh, had lots of young employees, uh, I encouraged them to do a 401k plan, and uh, we had 100% participation. And that's where the company participates in the profits. And I'm going to tell you, because uh, one of my longtime employees is. Uh, near retirement, he won't retire, but I'm going to tell you, he is, uh, he is, uh, came again from uh, a very tough family situation, been with me, uh, he's now been there 40 years, 
And uh, folks, uh, he, his 401k is admirable. Uh, he will have no problems. And uh, you know, that's what responsible people uh, are doing to try to help those who uh, you know, obviously can't help themselves. Uh, but as far as Social Security, uh, we've got to come up with a way to fix it, to extend it and make sure it's there for, for generations forward. And that's Medicare as well. Reverend Johnson, how do you bridge the gap between raising more money and not spending as much money? I want to, I want to be absolutely clear. What you did not hear Congressman Allen say, I want you to hear me say, Social Security is a sacred promise. It is not an entitlement. It is that which working Americans have paid into. And you can count on me to defend and protect Social Security. Did hear him say, and he conveniently put it in there. They dangled the, the carrot. You can be rich. He talked about his employee in that 401k plan. This was the plan before. Put Social Security on the stock market. Mm -hmm. That's what they said. You think about what would happen if your Social Security was on the stock market in 2008 and crashed. When the same day traders who are in charge of our economy now nearly took us over the edge and had to be bailed out by the truckload at the Federal Treasury. Let me tell you something. Franklin Delano Roosevelt came up with a great idea. That was a Democrat. He probably, that picture probably hung on many of the family homes who are watching this broadcast today. I want you to remember that. If you want to keep Social Security protected, you need to elect somebody who actually believes in it. He doesn't believe in it, which is why he talks so cavalierly about it. Now, here's what we can do to actually make sure that it's sound. Quit borrowing from it. Here's another thing we can do to make sure it's sound. We can raise the contribution limit, which is currently at $128,000 a year. You can raise that. You can raise that. He said the economy is so great, so let those who are benefiting the most from it chip in a little bit more. That's what shared responsibility is about. He talks about people as being poor because they're lazy. I grew up and was raised by two of the hardest working people I ever knew, my grandmother and grandpa. And they weren't rich, but they certainly uh, were poor because of systems and people who operate systems who have the mentality of people like Rick Allen. You know Rick Allen in every town. They think the whole town belongs to him. And that's why you can talk about folks that's working for him for 40 years. There are people who have other dreams besides helping to push your dreams along. <laughs> Johnson, we must, this is the, the question makes the statement that we must do better to improve our nation's federal criminal justice sentencing guidelines. We owe it to our youth, our families, communities, and nation to enact meaningful sentencing reform. Do you agree? Let me say this to the audience. You know, this is, this is really been something that's got at the um, and you may not agree with every fight that I've waged over time uh, as a lawyer, as an advocate, but you know that I'll fight. You know, I won't be bought. I can't be bought. And I won't be bought. And you got to know who you are before you get to Washington, D.C., before they start dangling the monies out at you. And if, in any other situation, be called a bribe. This is one place that I believe we can talk about some bipartisanship. In this state, I'm so glad I worked with Governor Deal as president of the Georgia NAACP to pass meaningful criminal justice reform. Reforms to our adult and juvenile codes, reform to our reentry program, reforms to make sure that returning citizens who've served their time be integrated back into society and become productive members and not on the revolving door back to prison. That's meaningful work. It's work that we did across the aisle. It's work that uh, we need to continue doing. And I will work with anyone to make sure that we set up such a system that benefits our community and makes all of our neighbors strong. Amen. Thank you. Some of you will be glad to hear that this is the last question. <laughs> Others want to hear more. And let me say that if we don't, if we did not get to your question tonight, I apologize for that. Blame me. 
or blame Bernetta, who is our time. <laughs> but I'm, I'm confident, and I don't want to speak for these gentlemen, but I bet they will hang around for a little while to uh, give you an opportunity to ask them questions, perhaps out in the lobby. But uh, here's the last question that we have, and we will start with Reverend Johnson. One of you gentlemen will represent our district in the next Congress. And you both are longtime residents of our area. While we live in an era of hyper-partisanship, at times that appear only to be getting, it appears only to be getting worse. Is there something positive that you would say about your opponent as we head toward election day? <laughs> Let me say this. You know, I'm running for Congress, and I've served in a lot of capacities uh, in this community, uh, but there's not single experience that compares to this. And for Mr. Allen to have done this as many times as he's done it, I take my hat off to him. Put yourself out there on the line. Put your ideas out there. It's a tough thing to take all incoming, all criticisms, and all darks, to have people mock you and who have never even had a conversation with you, think that they can say something about your character. You know, I don't I admire anyone who puts themselves for public service. I will say this, I came tonight not because uh, I'm under any illusions about this race. This is a badly gerrymandered district and we have to work very hard to win this election. And I came here to this stage tonight, regardless of the outcome of November 6th, to tell you the truth. To tell you the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And make no mistake about it, if Mr. Allen would start telling the truth, if Mr. Allen would start to get to the people's business and not the corporate business, not the corporate overlords who paid for him to, and his senior Congress, we would all have a better representative. If you make it to Congress over me, I wish you well, because we need Medicare protected. We need Medicaid expanded. We need Social Security. We need bridges, roads, and schools. And I want you to keep your word that this won't be the last time we see you if you make it to Congress again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, um, I, uh, uh, Mr. Johnson, I like your work ethic. Uh, you uh, obviously, uh, you know, worked hard, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I congratulate you on your success. Uh, it's not easy uh, to uh, to accomplish the things you've accomplished. I wish that uh, you know. I came from a farm, farm boy. Uh, I never thought I'd be a member of Congress. <laughs> Of course, after uh, being insulted this evening, uh, time and time again, uh, you know, I, uh, uh, it's just disappointing uh, that, uh, that, you have, that you have to go through that, to be honest with you. Uh, I have a wonderful family. Uh, I'm very proud of my family. Uh, yes, this wasn't what I had planned at this time in my life, uh, but I did it for my children, my grandchildren. I have 12 grandchildren along the way. And uh, I tell you, when I ran for Congress, uh, I, I really was not optimistic about their future. But I can tell you something. The greatest experience in my life has been, a, been to be a part of this last two years. Folks, you know, he wants the truth. America's back. And it's moving. And, you know, you can either join up or you can, you can criticize. But I'm telling you, uh, it's there. It's there for the taking. I have, I've been around a long time. I've been in business for 35 years. I worked for 35 years. I've never seen anything like this. It's and it's not government subsidized. It is you, the American people, doing what you do best. And that's getting out every day and making this country all that it can be and doing what God created you to do. Now, to be a part of that, you know, I, you know I, I thank God every day. Because frankly, um, it's been tough. It has not been easy, folks. Uh, we have been resisted at every turn. And 
and you know the formulas are you know in the business world you understand how to make these things work but unfortunately ideology and other things get in the way and um, you know I, I'm proud of the future I am excited about it and uh, I'm looking forward to going back and working for you Let me say to both candidates, we greatly appreciate your candid responses uh, to the questions that have come from, uh, mostly from the audience. Um, we'll now move to our closing uh, statements. Reverend Johnson, please get us started. You have two minutes. Thank you all for being here and listening to this public forum between uh, Rick Allen and myself. Uh, this is at the heart of what makes America the great place that she is. That we elect our representatives and choose those who will uh, exercise power on our behalf at the ballot box and not on battlefields. That's a beautiful thing. And as contentious as this race has been uh, and, uh, and all of that, it is preferable to the other forms that people choose their, their leadership. I am running for Congress, and I have already won a whole great deal. I have a wonderful family. I have a beautiful community that I serve, and I have wonderful neighbors who know that a neighbor is as a neighbor does. That's at the heart of what this campaign is all about. There's a story in the scriptures of a good Samaritan. And the good Samaritan is about what you can do to make a difference if you don't open your eyes. There's some folks who are so busy being busy, making money, so busy engaging in commerce, so busy doing whatever the things that they're busy, they don't see the hurting humanity in front of them. Mr. Allen, the fact of the matter is you've not done your job, and we can do better. We can do better for those who are languishing in the education system that doesn't prepare them for the 21st century. We can do better for people who are struggling in the healthcare crisis. And your plan, the plan of your president is to let it collapse. It's one, one fifth of our economy. We can't afford to do that. We can do better when it comes to infrastructure. You've had four years to put an infrastructure bill on the table and you've not done it. We can do better when it comes to encouraging economic development and growth in this area. You say it's the best it's ever been. There's a lot of folks in this auditorium who would beg to differ with you. Mr. Allen, you're probably a good man. I don't know you very well, but you've not been a good congressman. And it's time for folks, if they really want a fighter in Congress, who you know will work every day for you and not for anyone else, not a president or a party, and on November 6th, give me your vote, and I'll give you the opportunity uh, to see what real change looks like. Thank you. suggested to the president that we wait till the economy cools till we do some of the infrastructure other than broadband and other than um, the uh, making sure we had cell service. But folks, uh, our company can't grow because we don't have the workers to grow. If you talk to anybody who's in business in this district, you know what the number one problem and challenge they have? Workforce. Every one of them could grow their business if we had the workforce there. And that is what we're doing. And let's, let me tell you, salaries are going up. Well, you know, it, yeah. uh, no, we, we're, we're seeing real wage increase, people, because it's demand, okay? And I'm seeing that everywhere. We're seeing, uh, you know, let me tell you, we did tax reform, and, he, and he's commented about how bad tax reform was. When we saw AT&T, which he talks about as one of those big, bad companies, you 
know what they did? They gave a thousand dollars to four hundred thousand employees. How much? Ten thousand dollars to your reelection campaign. <laughs> 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 Uh, you know, I don't know what they gave in my real election campaign, but anyway, uh, you know, and then let me tell you, we're, we're with, uh, well, can I get a little more time here? Yeah, thank you. You've been given much more time in each question. Please, please. Reverend Jones. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I was with the president, and let me tell you what we're trying to do about our workforce development. We had companies and industry groups that committed to create four million apprenticeships over the next five years. Home Depot, one of our own Georgia companies, at their headquarters, their training center in Atlanta, so spent fifty million dollars training construction workers. Every company is doing this. Folks, I tell young people today, I've never seen an opportunity like this. The other situation you've got is you've got baby boomers who are retiring out of the workforce, which is creating a tremendous void on middle and upper management. Folks, the opportunities are there. We need to continue this. You know, we didn't have this. I mean, at, at four years ago, yeah. This, this, this district uh, was, was not where it needed to be. It's on the way. I'm very proud of what we accomplished. I've worked hard to make that happen, and I'm going to continue to work hard for you, and I need you both to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you to both candidates for being here tonight and sharing your candid answers to what I I hope we're good, well thought out questions. Um, the candidates will remain here for a little while. I don't know if you're going to this, but we'll be here for a little while to answer any follow up questions that you might have. Let me thank Ogeechee Technical uh, College for allowing us to use this venue tonight. I, I thank you all for coming out and participating in that. And for those of you watching uh, on uh, the internet, we thank you for joining us via that meeting. The forum in its entirety will be posted on statesborohero.com by Wednesday after 5 p.m. Uh, for on demand meeting. All of you clearly understand the importance of participating in our democracy and having a say in decisions that affect our community. Perhaps you could convince your neighbors to be as diligent as you are and urge them to cast their own ballot. Early voting is underway in Bullock County at the new County uh, Commission Annex on North Main Street, and Election Day is set for Tuesday, November 6th. Thanks again for coming out tonight, and be safe in your drive home. Thank you.